We're going to walk together. We're going to stand together. We're going to sing together. We're going to stay together. We're going to moan together. We're going to groan together. And after a while, we'll say, freedom, freedom, freedom now. The beginning of the year, very few people want to march. King is not that interested in a march. The NAACP uh, prefer to do legislation. The Urban League want to do more lobbying. Only the more militant sections, the SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality, which are the younger uh, and uh, more direct action folks, they're the ones that want a march. But they want a march on Washington, not a march in Washington. They want to snarl up the traffic. They want to get in congressmen's faces. They want to bring the sense of chaos and defiance that has been reigning through the South right into the center of, uh, of American power. Now, the man who uh, calls the march is A. Philip Randolph, a uh, trade unionist, uh, a black trade unionist who originally calls for a march for jobs and freedom. Uh, they want to raise the minimum wage, they want to address the issue of economic inequality. And his lieutenant in this is a man called Bayard Rustin. Now, Bayard Rustin is a very interesting and important character in the civil rights movement who is all too readily forgotten. The reason, he, I mean, he's interesting because he's brilliant, but he's also an out gay man uh, who had been a member of the Young Communist League and who was a conscientious objector during the Second World War. And so, in all sorts of ways, he is kryptonite for the civil rights movement, which is in many ways a kind of conservative, mostly church-led, male movement that kind of is not very easy with uh, the presence of this out ex-communist gay man. Uh, but his brilliance and his closeness to Philip Randolph triumphs over many of these concerns, and Bayard Rustin runs the show. Now, up until that point in 63, it's very rare to have marches in Washington. This was the biggest march of its kind in Washington's history. Um, they had hoped for 100,000. That would have been the biggest march. They get 250,000. Um, he has something like two and a half months to organize this march from the moment where everybody is on board. Now, they have no idea, right up until the last moment, if they are going to reach their target. And on the morning of the march, Bayard Rustin takes a walk uh, on the mall, and the journalists are kind of badgering him about kind of, you know, do you think this is going to be a success? Look around you, barely anybody's here. And uh, uh, Bayard Rustin takes a piece of paper out of his pocket, looks at the paper, looks at his pocket watch and says, everything is right on schedule. And then it turns out later that the piece of paper he took out was completely blank. He had no idea what was going to happen, although he, he kind of had high hopes. By nine o'clock, the trains and the buses start rolling in. By 10 o'clock, they know it's going to be a huge, huge success. Quite symbolically, people don't wait for the march leaders to uh, start the march. They actually just start. They're, they're kind of, you know, tired of waiting. It's hot. They're bored. And um, King and the other civil rights leaders are coming out of meeting congressmen that morning. And they say, oh, my God, the you know, the march has started without us. And Bayard Rustin says, we're supposed to be leading them. Uh, and so they throw themselves into the middle of the march, although if you look at the pictures, it looks as though they are leading something, but actually they're right in the middle of the march. It was just kind of clear for the cameras. King is the 16th person to take to the podium that day. There's an invocation, a benediction, I think there's a national anthem. There's a range of things that take place. It's 87 degrees at noon. It is a very hot day. So by the time King uh, takes to the podium about three or four o'clock. Some people have gone home, they've got very long journeys back, some of them by coach to the west coast. Uh, Rachel Horowitz, who organized the transport to the march, she says, you know, you have to remember there are no jumbotrons. This is 1963. People just have to fix on a speck and listen to it. And uh, that's the kind of moment at which kind of King gives his speech. 